Welcome to this introductory series of training videos for SOLIDCAM. This video's topic is the HSR toolpath. So the HSR toolpath is one of the 3D recognition toolpaths available from the 3D module inside SOLIDCAM. And basically, 3D recognition toolpaths use the stock and target definition to determine what material needs to be removed and which movements of the tool are required to do that. Uh, so let's take a look at the HSR operation. First, to get to it, you can go to the SolidCam Operations tab, and then 3D HSR, or you can go to the SolidCam tab, 3D, and you can see 3D HSR. And in each of the 3D HSR uh, prompts here, you can see that there is actually a, uh, a breakdown of the technologies in there. So you can actually grab it from there, or if you just right-click on any toolpath or on the Operations tab, you can go up to Add Milling Operation, and then there's 3D, 3D HSR there as well. Um, so 3D HSR requires you to have a stock and target definition, and also when you choose your tool, to input the fees and speeds. So let's actually take a look at the first use of HSR in this file, and that is using the contour roughing. But as an overview of what HSR requires, let's take a look at the workflow on the side here. Geometry is the target. Now you could choose new geometry, you could choose whatever solids you want on screen, but generally, uh, the rule of thumb here is to use the target definition because that is what you define at the beginning of your CAM part file, like we saw in the previous intro video, creating a CAM part file in milling. Uh, and the reason you'll do that as target for every one of your toolpaths is because it has one definition. So then at the beginning, that's the target, that's the file you want this thing to look like at the end of all your operations. And if you change what that definition is, then it changes all of the 3D toolpaths that you've created on your file. So it's a good way to just have one change and it filters through all your recognition toolpaths. Uh, but you could always choose new geometry if you're including, let's say, additional surfaces, additional solids. For whatever reason, uh, you can do that here. Under tool, you select whatever tool you're looking for to rough out your part. And you can see from the left menu here in the toolkit, these are the tools that you're allowed to use in the HSR toolpath. For, for more on how to create milling tools, I refer you to the Create Milling Tools video in this introductory series. For now, I'm just going to use this half inch flat end mill. And then we can plug in fees and speeds. In the constraint boundaries section, you're defining the boundary type. Now, the boundary is the limiting of the movement of the tool in the uh, X, Y direction. Basically, this is a 3D toolpath that recognizes the entire stock and the entire target. So if I don't add any kind of boundary, in this case, if I just use the automatically generated one that represents the outside edge of my stock, I'm actually going to rough out the entire part. But there might be instances where you want to limit the travel of the tool to just certain areas. Uh, so that's what the, you're, you're doing here. You're choosing either different, um, different items in here to create a boundary around, in terms of silhouettes or just the outside boundary, or under created manually, you can choose from these different options in here. Now, a detailed breakdown of what all these options are can be found in a playlist called HSM Boundary Type on our YouTube channel. In the passive section, this is the rules you'll give this 3D toolpath for how it's going to mill out your part. So things like how much material to leave in the walls and the floor. The tolerance is, in the case of a translated solid, uh, the surfaces might not be 100%. Maybe you want to increase or decrease the tolerance so you can get a tighter look or a looser look of your part. Uh, in the case of a badly translated file, you might want to take a little bit of a looser or a coarser tolerance around your part. Uh, so that you're not trying to machine every little nook and cranny in the badly translated surface. So really it's just the tolerance of the surface recognition. And then because we're really just doing a 3D toolpath around the part, we're really just looking for a step down. Minimum offset is your control over the radial step over of this toolpath. And because this toolpath can handle all types of shapes, sizes, and surfaces, we all not only have just a minimum offset, but we also have a maximum. So this can account for whatever shape of tool you're using, whatever portion of that tool you're, you're using to rough out your part. The remainder of this section is really just to further detail or, or, uh, or dial in the type of toolpath you're doing here. So in this case, this toolpath could do just the flats in a certain direction. It can smooth out the, uh, the contours found on this part. So if this is, again, a badly translated part and maybe the, the corner rads or the surfaces come out as tiny little triangular surfaces or linear edges, and you want to kind of smooth that out, you can actually just check the box here for smoothing and it takes those jagged edges and makes them smooth. Tech core areas 
basically is going to look for any kind of um, core areas, cavity areas, and basically just areas that are bulk in material. So they can treat them a little differently than just a simple radial step over. And then refined corners, if you look in that bottom graphic there, it just adds a radius. So really each one of these is just detecting portions of your solid. In this case, the flat areas is going to look at them and operate them on a little differently than it would normally with a tapered face. Um, all you're really doing here is just telling it a set of rules to analyze your solid and act on that accordingly. On the right side, further limitations of the movement of the tool. So previously we were talking about the X and the Y. Here the limits are just in the Z direction. And what you're doing here is you are again looking at the stock and target and determining what material needs to be removed. But with the Z top and the Z bottom, you limit the travel of the tool in the Z direction. So maybe I have a really large part file and currently I'm using a tool that doesn't have enough reach. Uh, I could actually just tell it to only go down as far as I have in terms of reach. I can click on Z bottom, click on a surface or just type in a value there and I can tell it to only analyze the stock and the target between those two Z levels. In terms of point reduction, what we're doing here is again analyzing the solid and maybe just changing the, the tolerance of how we analyze that solid. So fit arcs, we'll actually fit arcs wherever we can in terms of the, the between the data points that we've analyzed on the part and those data points that we are controlling are controlled by this cut tolerance. So basically, again, you might have a translated solid. You might not want to look at it with such uh, scrutiny that you're actually checking and machining all the little nooks and crannies, all the valleys in the surface. If you want to just get a smooth surface from a bad translated solid, you can make this, uh, this cut tolerance a little coarser. Going back to the smooth, how we actually tell it how to smooth out those corners is in the smooth tab. So here you just give it some rules as to how best to analyze those, those angular movements, those kind of uh, little jagged edges, and how to turn them into radiuses. And in this case, we can just tell it the maximum radius we'd like to use. Adaptive step down is the idea that we gave it a step down in the previous section, the passive section, but we're actually going to look at a solid that might not actually have nice steps along the part. There might be a portion of it where there might be features where they're at different heights, there might be features that uh, don't fall in between those steps that we've defined. So what you actually get to do here is insert or automatically insert extra passes. And then these are the rules on how those passes should be added. How many passes, what the tolerance is to recognize the need for those passes, that sort of thing. And then finally on edit passes, what you're doing here is you can actually get it to recognize the updated stock. So not just using the default base stock definition, but actually looking at the updated stock and to trim the tool path so that it becomes more of a true stock recognition. Not just looking at the original stock definition, but the actual currently updated stock. Or you can actually just get it to trim the tool path based off the target geometry, or you can load your own stock file. So possibly that your default stock definition is not the one you're looking at. The updated stock is not the one you're looking at. You're looking at a specific specific stock file that you've generated. Uh, this can even be one that you generated previously in the CAM part file, saved it somewhere else, and you're trying to avoid um, recognizing features that you've already added. So this is kind of a way to, to account for uh, possibly this particular toolpath is not supposed to work on certain areas, or it's supposed to ignore certain features that have already been made. Whatever the reason, you have the option there to further dial in this toolpath using that option. And then below here, is again the same idea. You're already gouge checking against the target to make sure that you're not gouging the part you're trying to machine. You can also come in here and you can tell it other items to gouge check as well. So in this case, I can gouge check against my vice to make sure I don't gouge my vice while I'm actually machining this part. In the link section, again, the idea here is that we're doing a 3D toolpath and it's generating a toolpath for us based off of the geometries of the part and the rules we've already given it. So here's another set of rules for how to move around the part. So Really basically, you can see that there's climb milling versus conventional cut, or you can do both in bi-directional. All these other options here are, again, to further refine your toolpath so that it actually moves around the part and analyzes, and maybe in some cases even connects portions of the wireframe to further optimize the use of, uh, of your tool around this part. Under ramping, you have the ability to tell it between three different types of ramping how to analyze and machine this part. So in this case, we can profile ramp into the part, we can helical ramp into the part, we can do just a simple plunge ramp. Uh, and each of those, once you click on it, it opens up an option for you to control that type of, uh, that type of ramping. 
The rest of these tabs here are, again, just further refinement. Uh, any, any more detail on this, you can always give us a call at the main tech line, and we can go through this with you to further refine your part. So let's take a look at what this toolpath actually looks like. Now, this one being contour, it's actually going to analyze the part and generate a contour style toolpath. Now, there's a lot going on here, but if you look at it from the side, you'll see that it's just simply the step down. So let's look at this from the side view. There's our step down. It has sliced up the part in those various Z directions, and we can see that it is actually just doing a step down. It almost looks like from this point of view, it could have just been a simple pocket. But now, if we look at it from the top view, Now you see the actual contour nature of the toolpath. It's analyzed the part to see where the bosses are, and it actually is starting from the outside going in. So you get this kind of racetrack style toolpath, and anytime it in incorporates a, a boss in there, you can see it actually gets that shape around there. So it's trying to do that rectangular motion, but as soon as it gets to a boss, it generates a toolpath that follows that, that, uh, that shape. So this one's pretty useful if you're not really sure uh, of the other options, which one to use, it'll always give you a toolpath that machines in all different directions. But let's say your part is in a particular direction. It's a long part, or it's a very basic part that has all its features going in one direction. Well, in that case, you can use the patch option. And if we open this guy up, what we'll see is really the same workflow. In HSR, when you change these guys, the only thing that really changes is certain things about the passes. So in this case, we still have a step down, we still have a step over. We actually have control over how far away from the edge we want to be. We still have smoothing. We still have the core areas. But what you'll see on the right side here is we are doing a hatch type toolpath, meaning that is it's a more of a linear pattern. We have to give it a direction. So defined by zero, that's actually zero degrees from the x-axis. If you take a look at my part from the top view once again, we'll see that we're actually moving only in the x direction. Now there are still some arc movements, there's still some changes of direction, but that's only because, again, it's analyzing the part, trying to generate this, this linear movement, and as it gets to a boss, it incorporates that boss into the movement of the tool. So you actually see a little bit of a circular as it continues to draw, try and do the linear. Um, so in this case, this is probably not the best toolpath to apply to this part, only because there's a lot of curvature in here. So I would get a lot of stop and starts as it tries to go around the part. And in terms of line, that is just choosing two points on your solid, and that will determine the angle around the part for you. Okay. Now, what if you weren't sure about which one of those would be the best, and you want to handle all scenarios in one, in one go? Well, that is the HM roughing version of this toolpath, the HM roughing technology. And again, all the workflow is the same. Under passes, you'll see there's a step down, there's a step over, but here you actually can control the step over in a percentage of the tool diameter. And then step over type. The options here are HM spiral, core, and cavity. The best way to look at this is core is when there are bosses, like we have on the bottom here. It'll generate a toolpath that incorporates how to work around those bosses going around the part. Cavity is the opposite. Anytime there is an actual cavity, pocket, valley, whatever you want to call it, whenever there's a depression into the part, it'll generate a toolpath more specific for those. And if you're not sure between core and cavity which one you like to do, HM spiral is almost the combination of the two. Take a look at that wireframe. In those first steps of cut, really the only boss is this guy here. So you can see it's incorporating that into the spiraling. It's actually just almost doing almost like a contour just around that one circle. Then as we further get down, you can see there's a lot more cavity work going on in there and a lot more boss work going around there. So it actually generates more of a core and cavity as it goes across the part. So this is a very intuitive toolpath. It looks at your part and figures out uh, the best way to machine it as a core or cavity strategy as it goes around. Now lastly is the rest roughing operation. Rest roughing anywhere inside SolidCam refers to the fact that you're taking a smaller diameter tool and trying to re rework the part after being done with a larger diameter tool. In HSR, because of its recognition nature, it actually is doing that anyway. And we can take a look at that in, um, in the default. So here we go. Rest roughing. The geometry is still the target because we're still machining the same target. In this case, we're using a quarter inch end mill. My boundary is still the outside of the stock. 
and underpasses, I still have very similar controls to what we saw in, in Contour. The only difference is in the edit passes. Under rest roughing, there is no option to not use the stock definition. This is a rest roughing operation. This is the default option here to use that updated stock. So it's actually just going to look at the updated stock and determine what material was left behind by that toolpath. And basically, all of that has been roughed out with the, the half inch end mill. This quarter inch end mill can go and do all those areas there. So those are all the tighter areas. Those are the areas in between the bosses. So if I left this as is, it would actually go back and remachine the entire part with that small diameter end mill. But let's say I don't want to do that. Well, that's when those boundary areas can come in handy. If I suppress this guy here, we'll see that this second rest roughing operation using the same tool wants to be recalculated. Again, this is stock recognition toolpath. It is keeping track of the updated stock. I'm just going to recalculate this guy real quick. And now I'm only using the quarter inch end mill in that boundary area that I defined. In this case, the boundary area is just around these bosses here. And the boundary area can be a sketch. It could be uh, edges of the surface that, or the solid that you've selected. Pretty much anything you can use to define the outside edges of your boundary area. And again, that was all covered in a playlist on our YouTube channel called HSM Boundary Type. Okay, so after that toolpath has been calculated, we can see that it's really just focusing on the area within that constraint boundary. So really just that area in there. And if we look at it from the top view, you can see it's just working on whatever it can reach in that area. So the HSR toolpath is a 3D toolpath that can be used on any part where you've defined the stock and the target. And it's the best way to remove the material in a three-dimensional sense. Uh, so this can work for standard pockets that have a little bit of a taper, or it could be even more convoluted like a part like this with different bosses and different valleys. Any questions of this or anything else from SlotCam, you can always give us a call at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2. And stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this introductory series. Thanks for watching.